This video is brought to you by Keeps. Avasti mates, Maroon Sea Dog Jared here to <clears throat> talk about a 2019 film so unpredictable that the phrase jaw dropping feels like an absurd understatement The Lighthouse. Whenever a movie leaves me feeling that weird cocktail of impressed awe and confusion, I have to wonder is this film too smart or is it just pretending to be? Let's investigate in this wisecrack edition on The Lighthouse, deep or dumb, and of course, spoilers ahead. But before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to Keeps. A lot of you know how much I like my hair, it's part of my identity, so I'm scared out of my mind about losing it, and from what I've learned, prevention is the key. If you've noticed your hair thinning and want to keep yourself from going bald, you've probably already invested in prevention techniques. But staying out of the sun or throwing away all your hats won't solve the problem because genetics are the main cause of male pattern baldness. Keeps is a prevention tool you can use to save your hair. Keeps offers FDA approved treatments to combat the symptoms of hair loss. With Keeps, you meet with a doctor online, order your prescription or over the counter medication and get everything delivered right to your door. With Keeps, some men even experience hair regrowth. If you're noticing hair loss, do something about it and try Keeps today. Click the link in the description or go to keeps.com slash wisecrack and you can save 50% off your first order. And now back to the show. All right, guys, let's do a quick recap. Lighthouse spotlights, no pun intended, the relationship between seasoned lighthouse keeper Old, played by Willem Dafoe, and his reluctant mentee Young, played by that vampire guy who's arguably the best young actor of the moment. Anyway, Old is gassy and gaslighty, potentially screwing with Young for his own amusement, putting him through punishing physical labor, and constantly trying to get him wasted. Bad luck to leave a toast unfinished lad. All this while also refusing to let Young look at his precious lantern. The day before they're supposed to finally leave, everything goes buck wild. Young kills the sh out of a seagull, causing a gnarly storm to brew, and then is like, man, do I need a drink. The men bond, open up about their past, and even sing fun sailor songs. Oh, oh, oh. When the ferry fails to pick them up, things degenerate fast. Young, who we've learned killed his former boss and assumed his identity. I just stood there as all just, just stood, watched him get swallowed by them logs. Loses all the shit and beats up old, eventually killing him. But not before pausing to hallucinate him as his dead boss, a mermaid, and a squid creature. Then Young finally gets to see the light, which is a beautiful, serene experience. Kidding, it just about kills him, and we end on an un-YouTube friendly shot of him lying naked on a rock while birds peck at his innards, which we have thoughtfully concealed with Nick Cage gifts. Okay, so what in the name of Poseidon just went down? The way we see it, there are countless possible ways to glean meaning from this film, so we're going to focus on three. Aesthetics, psychosexual dynamics, and mythology. Let's start with aesthetics. According to the film cinematographer Jaron Blaschke, Eggers said that atmosphere comes first, and then the rest comes out of that. And boy, this film's got atmosphere for days. It feels out of a different, non-specific time, with an old-fashioned, boxy 1.19 to 1 aspect ratio that visually smushes the two men together and makes us increasingly claustrophobic. They also mimic the look of orthochromatic film, which dates back to the early days of photography and was particularly used for portraits. Fittingly, the first frontal view of young and old is presented almost as if they're posing for an old-fashioned portrait, as they gaze at the camera unnaturally still. Orthochromatic film filters out out red light, giving the sky a washed out look and people's faces a darker, more textured complexion. It's evocative and surreal and makes the actors look weathered as hell. Because they were using old lenses and an old style of film, everything about the production process had to be super meticulous. The orthochromatic look requires a ton of light, and the film set was so bright that apparently some film crew members wore sunglasses even during nighttime scenes, which is honestly just called style. There's some intimation throughout that light is dangerous. The interior shots grow steadily brighter as Old learns more about Young's shady past, and of course, the lighthouse's extreme brightness seems to basically kill Young at the end. But it's not totally clear. Now, this film probably has the coolest aesthetics of 2019, full stop, but try as we might, we couldn't unearth any overarching meaning behind them. So for this one, we're going to say atmospheric as hell, but not quite deep, though definitely let us know if we're missing something. Let's move on to part two, sexuality, AKA your high school gym teacher's second expertise. Don't have sex, cause you will get pregnant and die. 
From phallic lighthouses to vaginal keyholes, sex is front and center, which is fitting for a movie that features dudes jerking their lighthouses about every five minutes. It's most obvious in the tensions between young and old, who, like your boomer parents, vacillate between yelling at each other and embarrassingly slow dancing. The queerish subtexts are pretty clear, and Eggers, along with actors Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe, told the Huffington Post that this was intentional. The whole thing is about power dynamics, so it is about Willem pushing, 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 and there's pent-up anger and pent-up erotic energy and pent-up smells, where is that breaking point? Indeed, the struggle for power is central to the plot. Old claims absolute control, telling Young to throw the rule book away because he's the king of this shitty castle. Manual says, My log is the only book on this rock. He alternates between telling Young to do the hardest possible chores and yelling at him for having supposedly done them wrong. He even dangles him from a rope just to be a jerk. These dynamics come to fruition in a bizarre mirror image when Young takes Old for a walk like he's a dog, in an image that feels straight out of a kink handbook. Here, Young is expressing the dehumanization he felt when Old regularly called him a dog, Swab dog, Swab, and reclaiming his power. Taken on its own, Old's behavior is just dickish. Put in the context of physical and emotional relationships with Young, though, it becomes pretty clearly erotic. As if to bring the point home, Eggers evokes the work of Sasha Snyder, a late 19th century queer painter who had to flee Germany because of his sexuality. In one of the film's most striking moments, Eggers recreates this Schneider painting called Hypnosis, which depicts one man's face shining light onto the face of a younger man, as if revealing some frightening and seductive truth. Is Eggers perhaps suggesting that interacting with Old reveals some frightening but seductive truth about Young? Maybe a new gradation of his sexuality? Now, we're not saying that they're gay and neither is Eggers. It's hardly that simple. Regardless of which way they typically swing, they enter into a tacitly erotic relationship out of loneliness or genuine sexual attraction. They're each fulfilling a need of the other. Old gets to feel in control despite living in a world dictated by the uncontrollable forces of the sea. And as for Young, Robert Pattinson explains of his character, in a lot of ways, he sort of wants a daddy. And boy, does he get one. The pure erotic fascination is given plenty of time to brew on screen. There's lots of secretly watching one another from a distance, and Old even calls Young pretty as a picture. There's also moments of reprieve, softer images of their relationship, like when they sit peacefully by the fire as Old engages in your traditionally domestic hobby of knitting. However, they still manage to make even peaceful, feminized tasks impetus for more hyper-masculine aggression. Not incidentally, their most tumultuous fight erupts over whether or not Young likes Old's cooking. Yeah. I see, Nate. You're fond of me, lobster. Say it. Rather than expressing his pain and vulnerability, something he might see as overly feminine, Old immediately turns to his most wildly violent impulses, literally calling on Triton to, uh, choke ye, engorging your organs till ye turn blue and bloated with builds and brine and can scream no more. Yeah, that. Old's sick-ass sea dog monologue brings us to another point, the film's treatment of the nebulous line between sex and death. Take this climactic moment when Young finally sees the light. What is he experiencing? Just pain? Or a weird pleasure in pain? That strange duality has fascinated many thinkers, including Georges Bataille, whose book Erotism, Death, and Sensuality outlines the odd relationship between these two aspects of human experience. According to Bataille, we are, from the very beginning, individuals existing in a state of discontinuity from those around us. That is, a state of isolation and loneliness. Death jerks us out of a tenacious obsession with the lastingness of our discontinuous being. That is, it literally destroys our sense of a singular, separate self. In doing so, it actually affirms our continuity of being. Or as literary scholar Nadesh Latou puts it, in death, we go from separate beings to a common ontological ground of being. Because we both desire that continuity and fear our inevitable death, we search for continuity elsewhere, specifically in eroticism. As Bataille put it, the whole business of eroticism is to destroy the self-contained character of the participators as they are in their normal lives, i.e. to destroy our discontinuity by uniting intimately with another. In this way, eroticism is a psychological quest not alien to death, because both are about recovering our lost continuity, overcoming our profound sense of separation. This idea feels very present in the lighthouse, most apparently when Young finally sees the alluring lantern, which has already been thoroughly sexualized. The moment feels in line with Bataille's definition of the sacred, in that it seems to cause Young both divine ecstasy and extreme horror, a phenomenon we also see in Young's earlier masturbatory adventure in the shed, which ends with him on his knees in pain. 
Now, according to Bataille, the experience of the erotic, that is the tearing down of your usual self-containment, is rupturous. Eroticism is often violent. The link between violence and erotics manifests in the many brawls between young and old, when they could be just as easily about to make love as they are about to kill one another. But the dichotomy is most glaringly obvious in the moment right after the two almost kiss, when instead of locking lips, they lock fists. Right here, we have a textbook example of two dudes not being able to distinguish between love and violence. Fittingly for this moment, Bataille opined that extreme seductiveness is at the boundary of horror, which we certainly see in Young's frightened reaction to Old's embrace. In The Lighthouse, there's a porous relationship between sex and death, love and violence, some literal and some symbolic. More subtly, there's the ongoing motif of a post-coital cigarette first seen when Young lights up after jerking it to his favorite half-woman, half-fish. Of course, the post-bang cig is coyly being repurposed for both sexual and violent encounters. Young describes wanting a cigarette after watching, letting, and or causing his boss to die. All I could think when he was done was, I, I could use me a smoke and he also lights up after killing Old. What's more, the original script even has him doing the same thing after killing the seagull, underscoring Edgar's intentions. Similarly, Old pulls up his suspenders after his rendezvous with a lamp, a moment the script describes as, as if getting dressed after a night with a woman. Echoing this moment, Young pulls up his suspenders after beating Old to a pulp, as if getting dressed after sex. Sex, death, what's the difference? All in all, the unique take on sexuality and the interesting treatment of the line between sex and death, love and violence feels pretty deep to us. Let's conclude by looking at mythology. The Lighthouse evokes parallels to numerous myths, fables, and folklores, drawn from a myriad of seafaring cultures. For example, the idea that seagulls contain the souls of dead sailors is a real maritime myth, which may have brought about the historical superstition that killing a seabird is bad luck. This effect was most famously described in the 1798 poem The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, which shows a sailor doom his ship by killing an albatross. As punishment, he is forced to wear the dead bird around his neck like an especially unattractive scarf. Young is regularly tormented by a hostile one-eyed seagull. Upon learning that the bird is Team Jacob, he beats it to death in a violent rage. This appears to seal his fate as the winds suddenly change direction and a storm ensues. But there's more one-eyed imagery to haunt your dreams. When Young inquires about the previous Junior Wiki, Old replies that he went mad and died. Be second. Mm -hmm. Died. Went mad, he did. Later on, Young seems to hallucinate the severed head of a man with one eye. The resemblance between the one-eyed former keeper and the one-eyed seagull is undeniable. So what does it mean? Was the previous keeper attempting to warn Young about the malevolence of the lighthouse? Possibly. Then there's the mermaid, who appears both as a figurine and an actual part lady, part fish, with, and this is according to Eggers, a vagina modeled after that of a shark's. Equal part beautiful and terrifying, the mermaid has symbolized erotic danger everywhere from medieval churches to Greek mythology, where sirens lured many a horny sailor to his doom. Frequently in such tales, mermaids pull their sailor lovers underwater, leading to some pretty awkward one-night stands. Such a moment happens during Young's masturbatory fantasy and or nervous breakdown. In this way, the mermaid helps solidify this aforementioned link between sex and death. Then there's the other assorted oceanic imagery which tends to revolve around Old. This is most notable during the men's deadly fight in which Old seems to spontaneously sprout squid tentacles before also fading into a barnacle-covered version of himself that, sorry, honestly just recalls this guy. Oh, and he also fades into the mermaid. What's going on here? Is Old simply emblematic of all sea lore, representing the way some men subsume their lives and identities to the ocean waves and thus get swallowed up in all its mysteries? Maybe, we honestly don't know. And then, of course, there's the allusion to the Greek myth of Prometheus, the titan who was punished by Zeus for stealing the secret of fire and bestowing it unto humanity. In this myth, fire symbolizes humanity's curiosity for knowledge and triumph over nature. The titular lighthouse exists in the film as a font of forbidden knowledge and the object of Young's obsession. And you know, it's also literally a flame. Now, the gods punish Prometheus for being a bad boy by chaining him to a rock for all eternity to have his liver eaten by an eagle every single day, only to regenerate at night. In the final scene of the film, we see Young's liver being pecked upon by a one-eyed seagull a la Prometheus. The gods also punish humanity by giving it its first woman, Pandora, described in Greek poetry as a beautiful evil. Through Pandora and her dang box, all the evils in the world are released. The theme of femininity and beauty as beguiling and dangerous is telegraphed throughout via the mermaid 
mermaid, as well as the assorted attribution of feminine traits and duties to both old and young. Is Young being punished for stealing the fire of the lighthouse? Is it the result of his fear of femininity and his latent desires? To be honest, we're not totally sure, and we're not totally sure if it's deep. Okay, so this has honestly been one of the harder films we've ever analyzed, and we think we know why. Eggers himself has said that he wanted to make the movie inconclusive. He wanted to raise more questions than answers. He wanted us to spend hours on Reddit trying to understand the significance of the lobster trap. This is a pretty cool approach that not many directors are brave enough to take lest they be labeled pretentious. We truly applaud it. The only downside is that such an approach can result in the film not articulating any clear meaning. The Lighthouse is many things at once. A love story, a hate story, a story of madness and obsession. But despite all these gradations, no interpretation fully makes a clear statement. The movie lacks a thesis, and it does so intentionally. As a result, we're a little dumbfounded. It's clearly not superficial, but can you be deep if you're not fully articulating a message? We're genuinely not sure, so we're going to split the difference and say quite possibly deep and quite certainly not dumb. But what do you think, Wisecrack? Has Robert Eggers broken deep or dumb? Or is there another interpretation we, like a one-eyed seagull, simply cannot see? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks to all our dope patrons for supporting the channel and our podcast. Hit that subscribe button like it's an angry old sailor who's making you shovel coal. And as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace.